You may be seated. The Lord bless you today. Thank God for each and every one that's here. Thankful for those that are watching by way of Facebook today. And we want to have special prayer this morning. There are those that uh, are at home sick, even that would have been here today, but they're not well in their bodies. So as we begin our service, I'd like for us to have prayer for those that are sick today in body. Sister Jones and I were talking just this morning on the way to church how thankful we are that we got the strength to get up and be able to move around. You know, we don't take that for granted. We count it a blessing. And, but there's some that are not well today that are not able to get up and be around and, and do the things that they'd like to do. So we want to have special prayer for them as we pray over our lesson today. And I, I know I told you you could be seated, but I'm going to ask you to stand. Amen. And let's take these needs to the throne room and ask God to touch those that are sick in body. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we know that there's no power and no, no, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. You've got all power in heaven and earth. Uh, and Lord, you said if we would ask, we could receive. And Father, we're asking today, Lord, for healing for those that are listening, Lord, to this Sunday school lesson today, uh, that are at home, not able to be out and about. They're sick in their body. Uh, and Lord, we're asking, Lord, that you would send your word uh, into that home and bring healing to their bodies. Uh, let the anointing power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, uh, minister to their needs, God. Uh, raise them up, Lord, off of that bed of sickness, God, uh, and bring healing to their bodies, Lord, uh, for your name's sake, for the glory glory of God. Uh, Lord, that your name would be exalted. Now, Lord, we ask in faith, believing God, and we're going to receive the same way uh, in faith, God. Uh, we ask, Lord, your blessings, God, upon the word of God today as we minister your word. Uh, let it bring health and healing to those, God, uh, that need a touch from the master's hand. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just so thankful that we have such a mighty God. A God that we can take our needs to, whether it be physical, spiritual, uh, financial, emotional, or whatever the need is, our God is a need supplier today. He did it back in the old days. Uh, he did it for the apostles. He did it for uh, the, the saints that have gone on before us. Uh, he's still the same God today. He's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we could ask, according to the power that worketh in us. That's the God I serve today. Amen, amen. So we want to go into the word of the Lord today. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, Old Testament again, Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. And we're looking at seeing beyond the present. Now, I, I know our Sunday school lesson took us in a, in a direction, but, but I, I got to thinking about seeing beyond the present. You know, folks, if, if we ever needed spiritual eyesight, we need it today. Amen. Because the natural eye, as what we're seeing around us right now, it doesn't look too good. Right. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of things happen. But by, but by eyes of faith, we have to look beyond what we're seeing now and what God has got for those that serve him. And so we're focusing today on the fact that God gives us visions of the future to, to encourage us to be faithful in the present. So let's look at Zechariah. I believe I'm going to turn to chapter 3, verse 1. We're studying from the book of uh, Zechariah today. And, and as we talked uh, last, last Sunday about Haggai, he was a prophet also that, that was encouraging God's people to get back building on the house of God after they had come back out of Babylon. And so the work had started, and then somehow or another, they got discouraged or they got dis, what is the word, distracted, uh, what they were supposed to be doing. And they quit working on the house of God for some 20 years. But then Haggai the prophet came along, and then there's Zechariah. He was a contemporary of Haggai. They were prophesying about the same time there in the, in the, in the land of, of Israel. And uh, so this prophet we're talking about today, Zechariah, he, he's encouraging the Jews to, to complete that work just like Haggai had. And uh, the only difference that, that they, the lesson noted between Haggai and Zechariah was Haggai's uh, prophecies were right to the point, consider your ways, you know, and, and he, just, he just told it like it is, and he just got right on through the message. But Zechariah, he was like some of, some of us. He was a little long-winded. And it took him a, what he had to say, it took a little longer. And, and even some of the prophecies were 
a little bit more complex than Haggai's prophecies were. And uh, just like this lesson today, it seemed real complex even to me. But we're going to do our best to, to whatever God's got for the lesson today that he'll, he will have his ways. And so uh, I'd, I'd like to just say right from the, from the very beginning, if we ever needed to hear from God, we need to hear from God in this day and hour. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. And, and it's, it's so true. It's not a time to be discouraged. It's not a time to be distracted. But it's a time that we, we're focused in on what God is doing and wanting to do in, in, our, in our world and in our lives in particular. You know, it's, it's not a time to be divided, but it's a time for, uh, to be unified. And, and only when the people of God are focused and unified can the work of God be accomplished. And, and just like it was in the days of Zechariah, when they began to come together and they had a mind to work, they got something done for God. And that's, it still works that way today. And uh, our lesson said that Zechariah was a visionary prophet. In other words, he had, a, he had visions. God gave him visions. Uh, in the first eight chapters of the book of Zechariah, uh, there are eight visions that Zechariah had, and, and they are detailed and recorded. And, and the visions uh, were um, all narrated according to the same power, uh, pattern. Rather, he, he received the vision, and then Zechariah inquired about the vision and the meaning of the vision, and then he received the interpretation or the understanding uh, was given to him by angels. And, you know, it's important to note that Zechariah wasn't giving his own interpretation of these visions, but it came directly from God, what the message was and how it was to be interpreted. And, and folks, I, I believe that's what we still need today, Amen. things that come directly from God. You know, we all have opinions, don't we? Amen. Pastor says we all have opinions. They're like our noses. They all smell. <laughs> Now I borrowed that from him. I, I, I don't. I don't know. He, he's always good at telling. I can try to tell a joke and I miss the main, the main line. I'm not a. You know. I don't know. But I borrowed that one from him this morning because he, 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 he's, he's pretty good at. Uh, he's. In other words, he's quick with it, and I'm like, it just goes right over my head. I just. You know. You can tell me a joke, and I'm like, huh? <laughs> Didn't get that. Uh, but but uh, Zechariah in chapter three. At the center of this vision, uh, it, it, it talks about the purification of the high priest by the name of Joshua. And, and there's a lot of symbolism uh, in this reading today, and I, I hope that I can, we can glean something from this today. Um, and so let's begin reading in verse 1 of Zechariah 3 and 1. And I'd like to say, I know I always put a little note on my, on my scriptures, but I'd like to say how much I appreciate Brother Joseph and Brother Mark always up there making sure that the scriptures are on the screen for us. And, and when I, when, even when I lose my place, I can look up there and I can see where they're at. So uh, thank you, brethren, for the great help that y'all are. You're a blessing to us, and we appreciate you. And so uh, let's begin reading there in Zechariah 3 and 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now this is his Zechariah's vision that he's seen. He showed me uh, Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And, and I, I got to thinking about that, how, how it's so like what we face today. You know, the enemy is always there to try to stop God's people. It, it's always been his plan, and he hadn't changed his plan. He's still doing the same thing that he always is. He's trying to stop the work of God. But, but we have confidence today. We, we can see beyond that because we know that greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. And, and so the enemy, he tries to stop us from being victorious, but the word of God tells us in uh, James 4 and 7, uh, submit you therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from, from you. So, you know, even though the enemy comes at us, God tells us how we can get rid of the enemy. First of all, we got to submit, submit to God. Lord, here I am. I belong to you. God, you see what the enemy's trying to do. And then he says, resist the devil. In other words, you don't let him take the advantage of you, but you pull back from the enemy and say, not today, Satan. You know, God's got this. And the book says, the Bible said, he will flee from you. So God's people are the ones that need to do the resisting, and Satan has to flee from us when we obey the word of God. 
and, I, and I'm just taking this verse by verse, and I, and I didn't explain this, Joseph, to you, but I've got the scripture that I'm going to be, I just went straight down with that scripture, but off to the right will be the scriptures that I'm using with that verse. Okay. You're used to catching up with me, right? Okay. <laughs> verse 2 said, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So we see here how Satan was met with a word from the Lord. And, and every time, every time God used the word against Satan, what did, what did the enemy have to do? He had to back off. Right. Remember, Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. Right. And the Bible said that Satan said, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But what did Jesus, how did he reply with that? It is written. It is written. The word of God says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is how we resist the enemy when he comes against us. It's with the word of God. And the word of God will overcome the adversary every time. Because here's the thing. The word of God is quick. Powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint and marrow. It means it can pierce anything. And, and, and of the joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. And so God's word will, will prevail every time. And the Lord just said, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. And so here Satan is checked by the one who has the authority to turn him back or to put him in his place. And I just like to say today, and it seems to me like the place the enemy belongs in your and my life is under our feet. Right. He doesn't belong on our shoulders telling us all kinds of junk. Right. But he belongs under our feet. Right. Amen? Amen? And if he's, if he's up here talking today, then you need to get him off of there in Jesus' name. God, I belong to you. The enemy's bothering me, and I want him under my feet. Get behind me, Satan. So uh, the, the question here also, the, there's a question in that, in that verse of uh, 3 and 2. It says, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? You see, the Jews, they were nearly destroyed because of their sins, and, and the Lord allowed them to go into bondage, into Babylon. They were taken out of their homeland, but a remnant of them were left, and God is determined to preserve them. So they, they have been wonderfully delivered uh, out of the fire, so to speak, that, that for the, this purpose, so that God could be glorified. And, you know, he has had mercy on, on, on them, bringing them back to their homeland. He, he's allowing them to build this house of God one more time. And, and so uh, I, I just wonder today, and I'd like to, to uh, put this out here to us, can we apply this word of God to our lives this morning. You see, for God has pulled each and every one of us out of the fire, has he not? Right. Uh, the enemy had, had us in his clutches. Right. And, and, but God, but God sent his word and healed us and delivered us from our destructions. You find that in Psalms 107 and 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. When we were walking the wrong path, when we were going the wrong direction, amen, somehow or another, the word of God got a hold of us and got our, our attention and God, we were like that brand pulled out of the fire or, or so to speak, that, that wood that was on fire was pulled out of that fire and saved. And that's what we were. God pulled us. Us. You know, so, though Satan had us, Jesus reached down in his, his mercy and, and his love, and he pulled us out of the devil's clutches, and he set our feet on that solid rock. Hallelujah. And, and when hell was supposed to be our destination, the Lord just grabbed us out of the grasp of Satan and made us a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. And no longer are we bound uh, in sin and in shame. But we've been set free in Jesus' name. Now, that just kind of rhymes there, but, but it's the truth that one time we were bound. But thank God we've been set free. We're not in bondage to the devil. You know, sometimes we, we allow the enemy too much room. You know, there's a saying that says, give the devil an inch and he'll become a ruler. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you, don't, you don't play his games. You put him where he belongs, under your feet. Amen. So uh, uh, Satan, Satan thought he had us, but thank God for mercy and grace. 
Uh, Zechariah 3 and 3, we'll continue on in that, in that chapter. It says, now Joshua, this is the high priest, was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Now for the high priest to, to be able to minister, he was supposed to have on that linen garment that right. was supposed to be, uh, he himself was supposed to be washed and clean, and so was that garment. But here we find Joshua, the high priest, was clothed with filthy garments, the Bible says. But if, if you look here in Isaiah 64 and 6, it says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, it says what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. Uh, as filthy rags. So uh, as Joshua stood before the angel, he appears to be polluted or, or uh, unclean, and his garments, uh, they, that, that was a shameful situation and a reproach for him to appear like that. So he had no, no, no clean garments to be able to minister in. But look what happened in verse 4. It says, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Now, you'll notice here two things are, are, are happening here for Joshua the high priest. First of all, his filthy garments are taken from him. And notice what was spoken to Joshua. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Folks, when God forgives us of our sins, that's causing our iniquity to pass from us, and he sanctifies uh, the nature and, it, and enables us to put off that old man. You see, when you come to the Lord, you, you know, you're like that high priest was. Uh, we, we were clothed with that, that sin and shame of the world and, 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 and everything that we could imagine, you know, was going on that was wrong in our life. But when we came to Jesus, he made us brand new. He washed us. He covered us in his blood. And we became a new creation in the Lord. And so it happened that way here for, for Joshua, the high priest. Then the second thing that was done for him was the fact that he was clothed with a change of raiment. And here's the thing, folks. It's not our righteousness that we're clothed with. But we're clothed with his righteousness today. We've done nothing to merit what God has done in our life. Amen. You know, as I just read, our righteousness is just like filthy rags in the sight of God. But, but it's his righteousness. It's his righteousness. It's what he has done for us that makes us uh, to be whole and to make, make us clothed. So, so uh, he, was, he was clothed with a change of raiment. And that shame of his filthiness and his, is gone. And the shame of his nakedness is covered. So uh, that's what happens when, when we become a, a brand new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 17 witnesses this. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. creature. Uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're not the same person we were before we came to the Lord. Amen. Our, our whole attitude, our whole uh, outlook on life has changed. Why? Because Jesus is living on the inside of us. Uh, amen. That cleansing blood that Pastor was talking about, that, that our sins were remitted because of the blood of Jesus. And we became a new creature in Christ. And so the Lord's taken all the old things away, and now we have become new. And so Zechariah 3 and 5 tells us, and I said, this is Zechariah talking now, let them set a fair mitre upon his head, so, that, so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. So we're reading here in verse 5, there's still more that needed to be done uh, for Joshua the high priest. Uh, he's, he's being uh, install, reinstalled and established in his office. If you'll understand this, that when they were down in Babylon, they didn't have all of this going on. The high priest going through the rituals of, of, the, of killing the animals and the blood being shed. So now here we see Joshua. He's getting reinstalled and, and established in his office. And so Zechariah begins to speak in this verse 5. And he's telling the angel in this verse to put that mitre uh, on the high priest's head. Uh, that, that crown of, of his priesthood is, is to be put on his head. And he is clothed with that priestly garment. So, so the covenant of the priesthood is renewed with this uh, clothing and the attire that was being put upon him. And, and, and it's called God's covenant of peace. 
and and our lesson talked about that, and it's it's reverence for, referenced from Numbers 25, 12, and 13 about that God's covenant of peace. It says, Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him, talking about the priest, my covenant of peace, and he shall have it in his seat after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of, of Israel. So so we're seeing here how that that the high priest is taking and putting on that that complete attire that belongs to him so that he can minister before the Lord. And, and, and so today we, as God's people, we, we are to be clothed in the righteousness of God. And, and we are to have that, uh, that, it's talking about garments here, but, but I'd like to go to the word of God over, in, and I'm not going to re reference it enough that you would need to put it on there. But many of you know in Ephesians 6 how it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Right. As God's children, we are to be clothed with God's armor. We're to have the helmet of salvation. Right. We're to have the the the, the um, breastplate. breastplate of righteousness. I, I, I was getting there. And, and we're to have our loins girt about with truth and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we are to have, above all, have that shield of faith. And then, of course, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Right. And this is what... It, 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 this is what needs to be even our, uh, what we need to be clothed with in our day and time. Just as the priest had a had a priestly garment and had on that, that mitre upon his head that identified him and that clothed him that he could be uh, used of God's service. And the only way we're going to be affected for God is if we are attired with what God has given us. And if we leave off any part of that armor, then we're, there's something that's going to be an open target for the enemy to come at and advance, at, advance on us with. But if we've got the whole armor of God on, then we've got that protection. So let's continue on. I, and I, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm making record time here. Woo-hoo. I'm in, I'm in verse 6. Wow. I may get through this lesson today. Well, we'll try. Uh, verse 6 of Zechariah 3, where the angel of the Lord gave a charge to Joshua. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, verse 7, Brother Joseph, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, God speaking, if, you know, when we keep our part, when we do what we're supposed to do, God's going to honor what he says. If, he's telling Joshua, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. So God is uh, speaking through the prophet of God, telling him, uh, priest, high priest, if you will just do what you're supposed to do, walk in my ways, keep what I've, I've told you to do, then make sure it's kept that way. Then, then you're going to be able to judge my house, and you're going to be able to keep my courts, and I'm going to give you places to walk among those that stand by. In other words, God is going to honor what he does. So God began to speak to Joshua these, wor these words that he needed to do. And, and I just believe that God is still speaking to us today as Amen. his people. Right. If we will do what thus saith the word of the Lord, right. if we'll obey what God's word tells us to do, then I believe that God will bless and God will give us what we have need of. We can be able to be the head and not the tail. Amen. We'll be blessed when we go out. We'll be blessed when we come in. Right. Amen. If we'll just walk upright before God, if we'll do what the word of God says, just be simply this, just be obedient to God. That's all it takes. Amen. If you want the blessings of God to overtake you, then you just become yielded to God. Become yielded to his, his what the Spirit of the Lord is, is desiring you to do. So the Lord, he, he's speaking here to Joshua, the high priest, about what was to come uh, in verse 8. Boy, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to silence that thing. Um, the Lord begins to speak to Joshua, and he's giving Joshua a look at what's coming. Verse 8 says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And we know who that was. Yeah. Talking about none other than Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And, 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 and in the scripture, and I, if you'll remember, I told you a lot of the what we're going to be reading has a lot of symbols to it. So a branch is a symbol of kings descending from royal ancestors. 
And so in Isaiah 4 and 2, we read about the branch again. It says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. In other words, God's speaking through the prophet Isaiah here, talking about the branch that was to come, uh, beautiful and glorious. And I just want to tell you, there's no one as beautiful as our Savior today. There's no one like him. Hallelujah. He is a mighty God. Amen. And, and, and there's nothing like being in God's presence and, and, and feeling the touch of the master's hand and, and, and so thankful that the branch has come. He's come once as the Messiah, but he's coming again. And so our lesson today is about seeing beyond the present. You know, Paul said it this way. He said, if in this life only he had hope. He yeah. would be of all men most miserable. And you know what? That's why a lot of folks are miserable today because they don't have any hope outside what's going on in their world right now. Right. They don't have Jesus Christ living on the inside of them. Many of them don't. And that's why there's so many, so much violence going on, so much ungodliness going on, so much, can I just say it, killing going on? That's right. My Lord. My Lord, it's as though a person's life is of no value to other people. It's like they don't regard a person and, and how valuable that person is and who they're valuable to. Even people don't value their own lives anymore. Some don't. They don't think about when they think about taking their life. They don't think about the family that's going to be hurt and left here suffering because they're gone. They don't... You know, that, that's the kind of world we're living Amen. in today because people uh, don't have that, that, that peace speaker in their life. Uh, and, and somehow or another, we've got to get the message out there. There's one that can speak peace to your life today. There's one that can take that troubled heart and that troubled mind and that desperate feeling that you have, and he can change that heart and put into that life a brand new heart. Amen. A heart to love him, a heart to serve him, a heart to want to do what's right, a heart that's full of the peace of God. Lord have mercy, I ought to be getting a whole lot of amens on that one. If you've got Jesus, you've got peace. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have no peace. Amen. It's just that simple today. Praise God. Praise God. So, oh, uh, he took my verse down, so I'm, you're going to have to help me. What verse was I on? Isaiah. <laughs> help me there. with What was the last verse you, you showed me? Isaiah. Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah. We're talking about the branch. Isaiah 11 and 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And here it is. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Talking about none other than Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. David was made a promise. Amen. Sure. That there was going to be a, one that would sit on his throne. And of his kingdom there would be no end. It was none other than the branch. Or it was Jesus Christ. Amen. Then Jeremiah, he spoke these words in Jeremiah 23 and 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David. a right, There it is. A righteous, a righteous branch. branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Folks, I'm just going to tell you, all the lawmakers and all the things they're passing laws with in our day and hour that we know are laws against the laws of God, right. that's not the final law. There's coming a judgment day. Amen. Right. There's right. coming a day when the true lawgiver is going to, going to pass the, his law, uh, is going to... Uh, to make sure that his law it, it, it has been obeyed and those that do not obey it I don't care what position they have in the government they're going to have to give an account for it. listen here folks it's time folks became accountable for what they're doing they need to understand they're not just passing laws because they're getting a paycheck they need to pass laws that's going to that's going to obey God that's going to get our country all out of what it's in right now and it's time somebody goes to to wherever they need to go in the government and start declaring it and quit being afraid to stand up for what's right. We're living in a society, if you speak truth, you get condemned. Amen. But you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. My God. You know, Brother, brother Dunn, I think I remember one Sunday saying that maybe I'll be a politician. And you said amen or something. So yeah. I think Brother Mike will even amen. I remember got a couple amen. But we need somebody to tell the truth and not not fear what man's going to do. But fear him that can destroy both soul and body. My Lord. Amen. I wish somebody would hear this today. Lord, I, I, I hear stuff on the, on, the, on the radio and I think, I just turned off. It, it makes me despondent. I'll just be honest. 
I think, Lord, I need some peace, and it's not coming through on that radio. That I'm, it's just a bunch of junk. My Lord, my Lord. Amen. So Zechariah's vision brought him to a time that he could see beyond the present to a time that was to be glorious uh, when Jesus Christ would come to this earth. He, 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 he wasn't among those that, got to, that was able to walk and talk with Jesus like the apostles were or like those that, uh, that, uh, that uh, like Bartimaeus and like, uh, who was that? Nick, uh, no, not, who was the little, Zacchaeus. You know, but he got to tell about Jesus, but he didn't get to see him. And, and we get to hear about Jesus. We've never seen Jesus. But, but we're looking beyond what, what we That's see right, right now. We're looking beyond the present. Right. And we're looking to a time when we're going to get to be with the Lord. I, my mind, and maybe you can't imagine. Some people have good imagination. My mind cannot comprehend what it's going to be like to get to kneel at the feet of Jesus. I can't even grasp it, Brother Billy, to think about getting to kneel at the feet of Jesus. Mm. That is an awesome thought. But one day we're going to get to kneel at his feet. We're going to get to cast our crowns before his feet, before his feet just like the, the, the elders did there in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. We're going to get to worship him. You know, down here our bodies get tired. I'm going to tell you. At 69, my body gets tired a whole lot easier than when I was 29. Of course, at 29, let's see. I had four kids. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was tired, just don't remember it. Huh, Sister Gunn? <laughs> four kids, yeah. Woo, Lord have mercy. But, but, but when we get over there, today we're looking beyond what we're seeing. That's right. There's a lot of heartache in this world, folks. But, but we have to look beyond that. We got to look to Jesus. We got we to keep our eyes focused on him. He, he's the one that started this in us. And he's the one that's going to finish it in us. We can't afford to look at all of the problems that's going on. Even in, even in our own family, sometimes there's problems. There's situations. But, honey, you've got to get your eyes on Jesus. Because when you look at problems, they'll bring you down. But if you'll look to Jesus, uh, hallelujah. I, you know, I, I, I was praying here not long ago, and I got to thinking as I was praying you know, about things going on in our world and all the problems. And, and I, I, I just, the Spirit of the Lord just began to quicken the Scripture that said, when you see all these things come to pass, look up, yeah. look up look for up. your redemption draweth nigh. So I want to encourage those of you that are here today and those of you that are even listening by way of Facebook, if problems are getting you down, you need to turn your head up and start looking up because that's where our redemption comes from. It doesn't come from looking around at the problems, but our help comes from the Lord. I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And when, brothers and sisters, when you start looking upward, I'm going to tell you it changed the whole atmosphere of your situation because you're looking to the one that's got everything in control. He's got the power to do whatever needs to be done in your life. If you need healing, if you need salvation, if you need a miracle, we serve a God that's got that kind of power. Amen. And so, oh, I, I, I get off my notes and I get lost. So I'll just have to jump in here wherever I think I can find my spot. So, so Zechariah's vision, it brought him to a time that he could see beyond the present to a time that was to be a glorious day when Jesus would come to this earth to save his people and to redeem them by his precious blood. Now, I know you probably think it like I think sometimes. If I'd have been there, I believe I would have been one of those that was in that multitude following him. And I think I would have, but we don't know. Right. But, you know, some followed him as long as they got blessed, right. the fishes and the loaves. But he said there's coming a time when, when you all are going to forsake me. And you know what the Apostle Peter said? or He said, but that was before Pentecost. He said, oh, though all men forsake you, I, I, I'm ready to die for you. But when it came time, the Lord said, before the cock crows thrice, you're going to deny me. Yeah. Before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me thrice. Okay, well, anyway, he did it. Peter did it. He did. And he had walked and talked with Jesus. He had seen Jesus take five loaves and two fishes, which probably was nothing more than a little lad's lunch. Something you pack for your kids to go to school with. But it was five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus, those disciples saw Jesus bless it, break it, and he fed 5,000 men and women. 
besides the women and children. Right. 5, and look at here. Not only did he do that, he said, now so that nothing is wasted, you go and you pick up those fragments. And they picked up 12 basketfuls. That's why I can say, truthfully, God is able to do exceeding abundantly. He proved it when he was here on this earth. He didn't just feed them. He picked up some fragments. He had the disciples to go and gather up. Don't waste anything. Hallelujah. Ooh, Lord have mercy. I can get real preachy right now. I think sometimes we let things, we, we leave things laying when God's saying pick it up and get blessed with it. Amen. We, 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 sometimes we're ready to walk out the door when God's just getting ready to bless us sometimes. Oh, we got we to gotta schedule to meet. We got to go here. We got to go there. For instance, for instance, I always indict myself. I'm just going to indict myself right now. A while ago, I, I had talked to my granddaughter, and I was wanting to get her something, you know, going to have a new great-grandbaby. And, and Mama, here's, here's how I shop now. I, I write them a check and say, you order it and let it come to the house. And that's how I shop now. I don't do it. They know how to do it. So that's, and I got up here, and I reached for my purse. I said, now, wait a minute. Church is going on. I can write that check later. I need to worship God. You say, Sister Creasy, shame on you. Well, yeah. we're just that guilty. I'm just saying, right. you know, God's trying to bless us, and we're thinking about, I'm thinking about writing a check. Yeah, right. It wasn't time to write a check. Yeah. It's time to worship God. Yeah. It's just simple things like that that we'll lose, we'll lose some blessings if we just let it pass us on by. Is that too elementary? Uh, no. Go ahead. But it makes sense, does it not? We miss the blessings of God because we're distracted. Other things, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta go there, I gotta, I gotta be here, I got an appointment. Right. When God is saying, just put it all aside, get focused on me, and let me bless you. You know, I, I think I think we we I'm gonna try to be nice when I say this. I think we do harm to ourselves sometimes and we blame it on the devil when we've just not been where we need to be. He gets a whole lot more credit than he ought to get when yeah. sometimes it ain't nothing other than this flesh. Uh, yeah. am, am, am I making sense with that? Okay. Amen. I, I must have said it okay, so I'm getting a lot of amens on that. Amen. Uh, so so uh, this branch that Zechariah prophesied about would cause all men to be able to be saved. The branch, Jesus Christ, he made a way at Calvary. It's not God's will that any should perish. Right. If people die lost, it's because they walked over the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. to go to hell. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. That, that branch we're talking about, he never knew any sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He did it for us Amen. so that we could have his righteousness. Right. So, so he begins to prophesy not only about the branch in verse 9, but he talked about a stone. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Now, if Brother Mark was up here, he'd go into those seven eyes. <laughs> Brother Mark, you, I hope we don't offend you. But it's because we honor your, your education. He is su such an educated young man, and we, we glory in that. Uh, but I want to deal with the stone, okay? I, I want I, I want to focus on that right now. I have laid before Joshua the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Uh, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Of course, we could we could pull out here about the engraving on the stone. You know, actually, the high priest they wore a, a stone upon their vestment and upon. Uh, one stone was six uh, names of the tribes of, right. of the 12 sons of Israel, and on the other was the other six. So the 12, 12 tribes of Israel were represented when the high priest went before, yeah. uh, before God to offer the sacrifices. And, and so we could, we could mention that. But we have a high priest today. His I name is you. Jesus. Name is and, and here's what he did for us. He took our sins upon himself. Amen. Who knew no sin? He he had never done it. Not not even was the the Bible says not even was guile found in his mouth. But he he took on the form of man. God incarnate in flesh <clears throat> took on the form of man. Came down here to this this earth that was so sin stricken and so 
such so much evil going on. And he lived and walked among them so that he could feel what we're feeling. You know, we have not a high, high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was at all points tempted like as we are. Right. Our high priest, that high priest that Joshua even, they had no idea what, what others felt. But Jesus knows what we feel. When we're going through trying times, when we're going through uh, stressful times, when we're going through uh, sickness and pain, he knows that. He knows he, he has felt everything that you have felt. He's felt rejection. Now, that's a bad thing to feel is rejection. Nobody likes to feel rejected, do they? But you know, we have to understand this. We can take whatever we're feeling and we can take it to our Lord in prayer and he can help us with it. He can, he can, he can take our needs and, and he can heal us with his, his precious touch if we only let him. So the stone, the stone, let's talk about the stone just a minute. We see the prophecy continues. There's a stone that the Lord had laid before Joshua. And if you look in Psalms 118 and 22, you'll look, you'll find, we'll read about the stone that the builders rejected. Uh, it, there it says, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Who, who did they refuse? Jesus. Jesus is that stone Amen. that the builders rejected. Matthew 21, 42 through 45. I brag too soon. Uh, yeah. Jesus said unto them, did, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? He's asking the people there. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, look what they perceived. They perceived that he spake of them. They were the ones, the rulers, the, the chief priests, they were the ones that, that had, uh, had denied him and had, had rejected him. And, of course, they were the ones that brought him before Pilate to be crucified. Right. So he was that stone that the builders rejected. And in John 1, 10, 12, it says he was in the world. The world was made by him, talking about Jesus, right. the stone. And the world knew not, but he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So we, we find here how that they rejected him, the, the chief priests, the, the Pharisees, the, those that should have known the law and should have known that how he was to be born and how he was to, to live and die, but, but they rejected him, and it was prophesied that, that, that they would reject him. Acts 4, 11, and 12 says, This is the stone. We're talking about the stone. We're talking about Jesus. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And then he went on to say, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one salvation name, folks, and that name is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only name that you can take on, amen, and, and, and get sins remitted in water is the name of Jesus. Uh, the, if, you, if you go in that water and you're baptized in the titles, you didn't take on Jesus' name. You just you were, you were baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But when you get baptized in Jesus' name, then you're, you're getting to that salvation name. Amen. Now I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Amen. That's when you take on that name. That's when that salvation uh, name is applied. And then Ephesians 2, 19 uh, through 22, it says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Look at here. And are built where? Upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And who's the chief cornerstone? Right. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Can I just say this without being offensive? A lot of folks' houses don't stand because they're not built on the right foundation. You've got to be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ. It's got to be the cornerstone that you're built on or your house ain't going to stand. I'm talking about this spiritual house. Ephesians 2.22 says, In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God. How? Through the Spirit. My God. Hallelujah. This is how we're built. It. Right. Amen. This is, this is how it happens. It's when the spirit of the living God comes on the inside of you. You know, you gotta be, you got to repent. you got to be bought or baptized in Jesus' name. And you got to receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's, how, that's, that's that, that spiritual house. So, so let's pick up a little bit later in, in verse 9 where it says, And I will 
remove the iniquity of that land in one day. When did this happen? The, this prophecy pointed to a time when God would remove the iniquity of that land in one day. When did it happen? Folks, this, this, was, this was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sin of all mankind. You remember when he bowed his head there in, in Matthew uh, and, and all, of, all of them, it, it talks about, you know, Jesus being crucified, of course. But I believe it's in Matthew where he bowed his head and said, it is finished. And then all of a sudden, something began to happen. The, the, the earthquake, and, and there was a darkness on the land, and then the veil of the temple was rent in two pieces, in twain, from where? The top to the bottom. And that was telling us and everybody that the way into the most holy had been made. How? Through the flesh or the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, every, anyone can go uh, before God for themselves. I don't have to have somebody to go before God for me. I can go to Jesus myself. I can pray and I can say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry of my sins. Right. He made a way. What was that like? At Calvary? No wonder we sing some of the old songs. At Calvary. At Calvary. You know, that's where our sin debt was paid. At Calvary. And so, uh, Hebrews 10 and 10 says, By the which will... By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. When did it happen? At Calvary. And every priest standeth daily. This was before Calvary. Ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats could never take the sin away. It pushed them forward for the next year. But when Jesus came, my yeah. Lord. But look here in verse 12. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice, that was his flesh, for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. My Lord, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, you see, Zechariah could only prophesy about that time. But brothers and sisters, that time happened when the stone or the or the branch or, or the one we call Jesus our Savior came to this earth. Amen. He bled and died. Amen. And he didn't just bleed and die, but he rose again the third Amen. day Amen. so that repentance and remission of, of sins could be preached in his name beginning at Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My Lord, my Lord. Uh, it, it's hard not to want to go into the book of Acts chapter 2, but I did that last night. Yeah. Now, the last verse of Zechariah 3 and 10 says this. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. And I got to looking at that, and, and I, I, I got to thinking, you know, if I would went to Bible college, I would probably know what button to push on a computer to find all this stuff, but I didn't go there. So I just start, I, I, I get my Bible out. I get my commentaries out, and boy, I'm just flipping pages, flipping pages, and I got to reading about that, that phrase right there that says, uh, under the vine and under the fig tree. And so, as best I could discern, Brother Mark, uh, from, from that, it, it is a proverbial expression indicating perfect peace and Hallelujah. security. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, when you have been born again of the water and the spirit, I'm going to tell you, you have been given that perfect peace and security. You are under the vine and under the fig tree. Hallelujah. My God, my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Zechariah, of course, was referring to a time that was yet to come. And, but, but we are living in that time, amen, where that God has poured out his spirit. We have been redeemed by the blood. He could only talk about it, but my God, we get to witness uh, to those that know Jesus as their Savior and are filled with his spirit. There is a peace that passes all understanding that only comes through knowing Thank the Lord. Jesus. You don't get it by signing a church book. You don't get it because you're a member of first so-and-so church, but you get it when you're born again of the water and of the spirit. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So living in his presence, folks, brings a sense of security that only our God can give. All our hope 
is in Jesus today. If you've got your hope in your, in, your, in, in your possessions, can I tell you, one day all your possessions are going to burn with a fervent heat. Amen. But only what we've got in Jesus is going to last. Amen? Amen? There may be things down here that, that we can't comprehend. There's coming a day uh, when there will be no more heartache, no more pain, no more tears, no more dying. And, folks, it's going to be peace forevermore. I know that we have a prince of peace in our lives and in our hearts, and I know there's times that we get troubled, but I'm going to tell you, you can take your troubles, you can go to the Lord in prayer, and God will help you. And here's the thing. God gives us visions of the future to help us or encourage us to be faithful right now in the, in the hour we're living in. And to hear these words one day, folks, it's going to be worth it all. I know some of y'all date back a little bit like I do. We used to sing a song that says, It's worth it all to be his child and serve him to the last long mile. It's worth it all to feel his power and know he keeps us every hour. Hallelujah. One day it's going to be worth everything that we've gone through in this life. Matthew 25 and 21 says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Folks, the Lord's coming soon. I'm going to say it again. The Lord is coming soon. And like those that heard the prophet Zechariah, we too are called to build. Not a physical temple. We're not trying to build a physical building. But here we are. We are to help to build that everlasting kingdom of God that will never, never fade away. Folks, there's, there's, there's folks that need to hear the message of salvation. There's folks that need, need to know the truth. There's folks that need to understand that if they don't get their heart right, they're not going to be ready when the Lord comes. And look at here, folks. We're the ones that can help them to know that. Amen. We've got Jesus Thank living you, on Jesus. the inside of us. Jesus it is the one that we're talking about today. He's, he's the branch. He's the stone. And no wonder Brother Joseph didn't know what I was talking about. I never gave him my notes. <laughs> Love your heart, dude. <laughs> no wonder I was commending y'all before I said all that because I didn't even give you my notes. There they were. I told you they're great guys. They do an awesome job. He didn't have. He never even said, "I don't have them." I saw him do this, but I didn't know what that meant. I'm not good with sign language. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We've got to see beyond the present. We've got to look, Amen, to the, to what God has in store for us. If we live faithful for Him down here, one day He's going to say, "Enter in to the joy of the Lord." He'll say, "Well done." God bless you today, Pastor.